Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, today we have on the show Michael Field, who is the Sydney partner in Everett Field Partners. Everett Field Partners are a specialist consulting firm who are all about driving brand and marketing positioning from the perspective of driving top line revenue in order to increase enterprise value. And in my discussion with Michael today, we really drill into an example of what it looks like from the inside in driving enterprise value. When we look at the experience of Michael in working within an organisation that was preparing for business sale over a fixed three-year horizon. So in this episode, we drill into what organisations can do, and indeed in this example, what was done within this organisation to drive the end value of the business at exit within an industry that was undergoing aggressive consolidation and a congested market where prices were being forced down and incentives for clients were increasing. So the job was huge to retain and grow existing clients and to acquire new clients, all while keeping a laser-like focus on driving increased profitability. So in this episode, we walk through the example of how this was done and how the business became the largest player in Australia in its key categories, eventually selling for 12 times EBITDA, having achieved an EBITDA margin that was at least 50% higher than its major competitors. So not only do we walk through what was done to ready the business for sale, we also look at the key insights and takeaways for business owners to be mindful of as they're growing their business. This is a really great episode, even if I do say so myself. So buckle in because here we go. Michael, I just want to say a massive thank you for joining us on the Deal Room podcast today. Oh, thank you for the invite. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today. Well, I and I'm really interested um, in digging um, into this story today because I think it will be of a lot of interest to our listeners. But before we do that, let's step back one step and, and talk about, I guess, the title of this podcast, Driving Enterprise Value. Why in a nutshell, why are we talking about this topic today? Why is this something that is dear to your heart? We work with a lot of private businesses, family-owned businesses, and as you appreciate, these people have invested many years of their lives into a business. Um, at a personal level, they would have made commitments and promises to their partners and family around, you know, this is worth it. We're going to do this. It's going to be, you know, it's going to pay off for us. Yeah. They put an enormous amount of um, discretionary effort over and above the normal effort of an employee. Mm. And um, it's our view that they deserve their payday. They deserve to be rewarded properly for the effort that they put into um, building an enterprise. They take on the risk. They employ staff. They invest mm. in R&D. There's so much that um, the business owner takes on. And um, it's our view that if they lose sight of why they set out to build that enterprise um, and um, outside of it, keeping them, you know, gaining gainfully employed for whatever period of time they grow the business. Most owners in our experience are um, enormously disappointed with the valuation that they get for their business when they're ready to sell. And yeah, I mean, look, this is just a topic. And for those of you who are regular listeners to The Deal Room, you'll know that it's a topic that comes up again and again and again, because it's such an issue. Um, It's such an issue in the market. And um, I, I think what I see a lot of is businesses, business owners spending a lot of time uh, focused on the concept of growth without the concept of what creates saleable value at the end of the day uh, without really thinking through to that until it's sort of this last minute 
afterthought perhaps right at the end when they're getting really close to eggs and they have to. Um, is that your experience as well? Yes, it is. And and it's understandable why. Um, like the 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 dimensions of um, the character of a startup business, the entrepreneur who's prepared to dive in, when you're in the early stages of growing a business, um, any revenue is good revenue. So you don't have um, a detailed view of ideal customer. You don't have a detailed view of optimum product set. You're really just trying to get the cash register ringing. Mm. And what what then happens is that 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 at a cultural level tends to permeate the business as it grows. And that might be great when you're going from, I don't know, say one to 2 million or something like that. And you just go, just get on the phone, call people, make sales happen. Mm. But once you get into that three to 5 million space and, and you might be geographically expanding and these sorts of things, the, the, um, the discipline that you have to have around where to focus your effort and what competitive assets you need to build build is often overlooked mm. so the, the the mindset of any revenue is good revenue happens and and there's no analysis of the of the profitability of different profit product lines there's no analysis of um, marketing expenditure um, it all just happens and and um, um, without and I'm not saying that they don't put effort into it. I'm just saying that the right type of thinking isn't applied to it to really focus on, is this actually creating value? Mm. Are we actually building value in this asset? And if we took away our emotional connection to the business, if this was viewed by a dispassionate you know, third party who was looking to either invest in this business or acquire the business, would they value the same things that you're valuing? Mm. Um, mm. And and it's a it's a fairly uh, brutal lens, but it's a good lens to look through if you want to if you want to understand how to drive enterprise value and how to create value in a business. Mm. So then, what I'd really like to do now is is drive into this experience, this case study um, of of your experience at the coalface of uh, working inside an organisation as you're creating enterprise value, growth, and change. So maybe why don't you give us a little bit of a background of uh, the organisation and how you came to be there and what the issue was as you started in, in this organisation. Sure. It's the origin story actually of the Evett Field business is that um, my business partner, Mike Evett, was um, the chief executive officer of a, a, um, a large um, um, business services uh, organisation. Uh, that business was um, previously a listed business that got delisted by a private equity firm and um, a range of um, decisions were made around how to drive growth and set a, 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 a you know um, a deadline for that sale so I was recruited in a marketing and strategy role uh, reporting to Mike Evert who was the CEO and there were quite a number of things that were obvious to us. Um, one of those is that the the market um, in terms of competitors, they were all focusing on very, very large clients. They were elephant hunting. Mm. Um, elephant hunting um, has its benefits, but it's a long sales cycle. Um, the margins were much um, lower and we started by just trying to understand market size and contestable market. There's a very, there's a much smaller number of very large players uh, in terms of customers who were who everyone was competing for, which just drove price down and made um, winning that business so much more difficult. And through a market segmentation and market sizing exercise, we really discovered that the the volume of revenue available in the small to medium market was massively larger than the than the top end of town. Um, winning the business was, although time consuming, if we could get scale and efficiency in winning that SME business, we would actually get a much better revenue outcome, but more importantly, get a much better profit outcome for the business. So mm -hmm. we were able to acquire customers um, and we developed systems to do that, but we were able to acquire um, customers at a very, very low cost of acquisition cost of finding a new customer. Um, the, the margins that we were able to charge those clients were, in, were, were much higher and um, we were able to operate those clients every year without any pushback whereas in the large end of town you'd be locked into a price point that might stay for three years and you couldn't upgrade it even if petrol prices went up or some other you know, business cost went up so so we were able to um, materially grow um, that business we we were growing at a much faster rate than our competitors we were obtaining much 
um, greater margin than our competitors. And um, to our great surprise, none of them knew how we were doing it. And we, I must say, that's one of the most fun parts when you're when you're really nailing it in the market and your competitors are just scratching their heads. So, um, yeah. that, like I and, say, that's the origin story. And and so was that uh, so the recruitment of you into this organisation at the time? So yes. so so just stepping back through the story, um, the the organisation. Um, was private equity backed, um, and so there was obviously a, a period of time. Well, I, I'm guessing there was a period of time that uh, that was given, and there were there were future exit plans. Is That's that, right. Uh huh. Yeah. And so the so you came on primarily with the aim of growing enterprise value for to sit in line with that future exit plan. Is yeah, that the abs- idea? Absolutely. The um the the, the brief um in the recruitment process was that at the end once you know once the um the transaction is concluded you will no longer have a job. You know the day mm. we get ink on the paper, um you know you won't get to stay in the business. And I was really comfortable with that. Most of the businesses I'd worked in in the past, and most of the roles I'd been in, in the past, were in businesses that were preparing for some sort of material change, either acquisition or or something like that. So, um yeah. That was that was the brief. Um, I sort of say it with a bit of humour because um, I recall the interview <laughs> um, where you know it was made quite clear to me that um, that f- through the lens of marketing, unless you know, in- any suggestion that would come forward or any recommendation, unless you could show a straight line to uh, revenue generation and increasing enterprise value, don't bother putting it up. Um, yeah, right. Interested in it, um, and in fact, you'll lose credibility with the board if you if you put anything up that you cannot demonstrate a direct line to revenue and enterprise value. So it was yeah. a beautiful discipline, a beautiful um, environment to be working in. Mm, and and do you think you you know I mean that right there in what you're talking about right now the aim with which you were um, brought into the organisation right there is the very first difference I think between you know a really sophisticated um, and organised organisation versus the owner led you know organisation the organisation that is still being led by the the entrepreneur as we were talking about before. Yes. That, that has started the business. Yeah, I think so. And it's the clarity of thinking that's required to do that. And you can still do that with tremendous passion and energy. It doesn't need to be a, um, a you know, a sort of a, a, a cold and merciless mindset. It's just one that's very, very focused. So you understand what adds, adds value and you understand what doesn't. And you lead the team in the business and you lead the decision making in that business and the thinking in the business to focus on those things. Mm. So you still can do incredibly meaningful work. You can actually engage the team at a much higher level because there's a real target you're going for and it's a really interesting, meaningful target. Um, and it forces, um, and I'm talking outside of the executive here, it forces the other um, uh, business leaders, departmental leaders and those sorts of things into a new form of thinking. Mm. Um, and we think that that's a really valuable thing. Um, if you've ever been part of that process, and I imagine many of the people listening to this podcast have, um, intellectually, it's a very stimulating uh, space to be in. It's mm. not business as usual. It's business with a purpose. Mm-mm, absolutely. And so, and so, what was the outcome then? Um, what was the, I, I guess, the enterprise value uplift from this change in focus? And and what, and then we'll come back to digging into some of these strategies. But let let's start with what the the end result was what, what, due to all these changes. Sure. Well, I guess um, the ultimate measure on that was that, um, you know, in terms of a multiple, it was, you know, sold for a 12 times EBITDA multiple, which was um, a terrific result uh, wow. for the owners. Um, you know, um, EBITDA margin was at least 50% higher than that of the major competitors. Wow. Um, and um, the, the, the business... Um, the, I guess the competitive tension that we created around the sale of that business was such that um, the three people who had the most to gain or lose, the three organisations who had the most to gain or lose by ownership transfer of that business were all um, competing um, for that at a level that produced 
a, you know, a fantastic result for the owners. Mm -hmm. So um, at the time, that was certainly the largest transaction of its um, kind in that industry, in that category. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 um, the market was sort of um, quite shocked at the result that we got, but um, mm. you know, we think it was a good outcome. Wow. Okay. Fabulous. All right. So then let's reverse engineer this. Let's look sure. at what we did to get to that result. And what we, and and just also so that we can couch this, um, what was the period of time uh, from, uh, I, I guess, your entrance to then that exit date? Sure. The, it's a it's a three year process. Yeah, it's a three year process to to build that um to build that um a business. Um, I was brought in um in the later part of the first year of that process mm. uh, to drive the bits that I was uh, focused on. So my engagement was approximately two years. Um, yeah, but the process so the process had been in play for about twelve months before I was engaged. Great. Okay. I mean, that's quite a short time frame, isn't it, for for the outcomes that were achieved? Yeah, I think so. Um, and it's it's one of those things that um, most people think it's either going to be much longer than that or much shorter than that. Uh, but realistically, three years gives you enough time to do all of the things that need to be done and actually start to uh, embed and bank the results from the work that you've done. Mm. Um, for example, you rationalise IT and operations and these sorts of things, or that you don't really see the benefits of those start to bank, wash through, you know, in maybe six to 12 months mm. where you really start to see that play out. So you need that, you need that time to embed the changes because there was a huge number of um, um, structural and operational changes that took place at the same time as we addressed the marketing challenges um, and the segmentation and um, our customer um, approach that we took. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. All right. So that, let's go back then. Let's reverse engineer this process. Um, what are what are the key uh, key elements that you worked on that you believe led to the um, the growth in their outcome at exit? And and I guess we've talked a little bit uh, about it in terms of the movement from hunting the elephants to looking at the SME market. So, but. Let's walk through that and any other uh, focus during that time. The first task in this is actually to get a handle on the true winnable market, the contestable market, the, the market size, and also market outlook. So the business that we were in was um, um, heavily exposed to business records management, which includes paper records in archive boxes being stored in secure off-site locations. And there were many people who were talking at, about paperless office, for example, at that stage. So there were some um, um, market communications around that storage of paper won't continue to grow, that'll be a business that will run out of um, market. So we did an enormous amount of work on the total number of um, paper pages that are purchased, like how many boxes of reflex are actually bought uh, mm. in Australia and how many of those um, um, get re you know, thrown into um, recycling bins, how much paper goes into the shredded bins, um, how much stays in storage uh, and really understanding different customer types and how they were engaging with paper management records, paper uh, record management, I should say. And so, and so how did you do that? How, how did you uh, work out the different customer types and how they were engaging? What was that process? Sure. One, one part of the task, and there's quite a number of moving pieces to this, and we may not be able to cover it all, but one, one, one piece was to actually get a sense of from the current um, a profile of customers, what industry categories do they fall in? So doing a simple task like, say, matching all your customer um, company names with DUNS numbers so you can match it to an industry code. And then you can start to do some um, evaluation on an industry-by-industry -industry basis as to where does volume come from, where does growth mm -hmm. come from, where does mm -hmm. revenue and profit come from. So out of the, you know, say, 2,800 categories or however many industry categories that we were dealing with at the time, there was a 
a, a, a specific set of those that actually produced the best result. So what then what you can start to do, and I'll just go to an implementation example here is we geared the salespeople differently on different industry categories. Mm -hmm. So we said, if you win this type of business, it will not contribute in any way towards your bonus. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if you, if you bring this type of business at the same revenue, the same number of boxes, it will contribute to your bonus structure. So we geared the whole organization um, in terms of their actions to be think to be responding to the insights that we were finding at the at the market research level so that's one example mm. um, once you've got that sort of data and you can work on growth rates by category and and uh, volume storage revenue up rates and these sorts of things it's very easy to build that out into a um, a projection over what the next three to five years are going to look like. Um, The other thing that it gave us opportunity to do is to knowing the total revenue of our competitors and applying a similar uh, profile model to it and assuming that they had a similar distribution of clients, which we believe that they did, we were then able to understand market share likelihood by category so whether or not we were strong in an area where we when we looked at the whole market was that kind of tapped out and not worth pursuing and putting effort in what were the areas that were rich veins of profitability that were largely unvended either by us or our competitors so that that's an example where you take that kind of strategic thinking and insight and you push that into the business and you operationalize it through a through a sales strategy Mm, okay, I love it. All right. And so we talked about the operationalized element with the sales force, um, you know, the, and, and the, I just love that, the differences in the bonuses that <laughs> applied. Um, and, and backtracking, assuming that was on the basis that particular industry segments were more categories, were more, more, were more profitable than the others. Was that what was driving that bonus, different bonus calculation? approach yeah, a- absolutely that, that that was a that was a category that we saw with, um, offered greater volume mm. um, it offered um, higher margins and we also saw that there was um, we built specific models so for example um, small and medium law firms were a good target interesting so so let's use law firms as an example then how maybe if we can can you dig into that side a little bit more for us Sure. Law firms, small and medium law firms are actually a good example of one of the categories that we considered to be really attractive. And why? Maybe you can tell us why. Yeah, sure. The the reasons for that um, come down to the value of the information inside the boxes that they're storing. So, for mm. example, many small and medium um, sized law firms will, um, you know, down in the car park of the building, they'll have a sort of a, a, a cage there and they just load up archive boxes in in the cage under the building or you know they load them in a spare office or something like that now the risk of loss of some of the documents inside that or those documents getting in the wrong hands is really really high um it's reputationally a very high risk factor for a law firm and it's not one that they want to be exposed to but they might not be aware of that risk so in terms of creating a value proposition that's meaningful to those um, small to medium law firms, rather than talking about you know box rates and how much per month for storage and these sorts of things, you can have a much more interesting conversation to say, well, how many boxes are you storing on site? Um, if you were locked out of your building for any reason, or the building was not you know was on fire or something like that what's the value of the contents that are gone and how much business impact would that have on you in terms of you continuing to run your business? Mm. So you can start to have conversations that are much more business and risk focused with somebody who understands those things and then the decision for them to move 100 boxes or 200 boxes, archive boxes into storage that they can recall any time they want is a very, very easy decision to make. Mm. And if you can wrap the right value proposition and sales conversation around that, it's an enormous market. Every suburb has got half a dozen small to medium law firms set up in it. And um, we saw that as a uh, as a place that was not price, as a group of people that were not price sensitive, they understood the risk. Uh, they could see the value in in freeing up office space and maybe not paying whatever they were paying per square meter for their, you know, for their 
fourth floor office or something, mm. um, using that for more more valuable um, um, pursuits. Um, and the, the the net effect for us is we were able to completely dominate that market. We just mm. took thousands and thousands and thousands of boxes that were actually unvended so they weren't being serviced by another competitor they were just sitting in hallways mm. so that, that's that's an example of to say well how do you go and unlock revenue that nobody else is getting and mm. how do you leave your competitors wondering where you got that revenue from and how you managed to do that Mm, That's such a good example. I absolutely love it. And you talked earlier about um, assets. I can't remember what you said about it, but when when you mentioned it, I I I really picked up on those words because I think that was a it's it's a really interesting concept for business. In in what sense did did the business build, or did you encourage the business to build assets? Sure. So we were talking earlier about what we'll, we'll refer to as competitive assets. So they're, they're, they're um, assets that are going to continue to create value long mm. after they were built. Mm. So, for example, um, a sophisticated sales strategy is a competitive asset. Most competitors, particularly in that space, um, the quality of uh, conversation that they were able to have was limited to, you know, how many boxes do you have? How much are you paying per month? You know, mm, we'll, mm. we'll transfer them over, you know, at no charge, you know, and we'll pay the exit fees for the other supplier. So they were very price driven conversations. Mm. When you start, um, once you identify that there's a really um, rich vein of opportunity in, in a segment, small to medium law firms, and you understand that they'll respond to a message like risk and certainty better than they will to price per box. Um, And then you actually build that capability into the sales team. You train on that, you reward on that. That's a competitive asset because you're not just saying, hey, guys, Mm. go out and get this category. You're saying that's a category we want. Here's the numbers. We actually know the winnable market. We know how much total revenue is available. We know how much we've got. We know how much we want to get. And this is the sales strategy so we're going to build and we're going to train to that and we're going to reward to that and that way you get delivery of the competitive intent so what's set at a strategy meeting to say this is what we're going to do you're actually building those competitive assets and you're measuring against that um, to make sure that you're delivering on that so you you imagine that across uh, multiple categories across multiple geographies, multiple tiers in 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 um, in um, business size that you're pursuing, uh, you get a disproportionately high return on investment because the whole business is pointed to the things that drive revenue. Mm, absolutely, and so so then I guess out of viewing your experience uh, in this organisation. What would you say are the main takeaways that you think are applicable across the board to organisations that perhaps have a view of exit at some point um, in their uh, in their business life? Sure. The, the the main takeaways are really getting a handle on the hard numbers as somebody else would view them, as opposed to how you would view them. Um, most. Um, organizations believe that they do a better job than their competitors, but that's something that can be measured. Mm. Um, Most organizations unfortunately rely on fairly generic claims around, you know, product, service, people, quality, uh, et cetera. And our view is that they should be immediately dismissed as uh, as um, competitive assets. And the reason for that is that if you look at the two or three websites of your nearest competitors, they will also say that they have the best people, the best quality, the most experience and those sorts of things. So I'm not saying that they don't exist inside the business. I'm just saying in terms of a marketing tool to attract new customers, they have no competitive value. Mm. Um, So really being willing to surrender some belief systems around how good the business is and being able to... um, uh, independently examine the fact base around the market size, around customer buying behaviour, around the numbers within the segments and where the opportunity might sit and then the things that the business needs to focus on to to unpick those things. And what that often does is it often challenges people's personal preferences. They go, well, I really like that market or this is a product that we've put a lot of R&D into so I don't want to give it up so easily. And we then uh, were obligated to say, well, 
that's okay if you want to do that, as long as you understand that that's an experiment with your money and it's a distraction from enterprise value. And if that's how you want to um, spend management headspace, then that's a decision that only you can make. You're the owner of the business. But if our agreement is to drive enterprise value, that needs to go. So you, mm. you, one of the takeaways I think on this is that it that is not for the faint-hearted. You know, this is a process that the numbers will um, be the numbers, and and if you genuinely want to maximise enterprise value, you sometimes need to be willing to give up things that you thought to be true. Um, you need to be willing to. Um, hear things that you might not like hearing. Um, but um, also if you're prepared to do, um, you know, do the things that, um, that, that, the, that the data produces, that you're going to get a benefit that is what you probably set out in the business for in the first place. Mm. And so it, it, there's a number of things I want to get back to. The, the very first thing is um, in previous discussions, you, uh, um, you've said to me that you, you don't necessarily, you're not really interested in working with the lifestyle businesses. You're looking, looking at working with really driven businesses. Can we dive into that a little bit? Do you feel that these strategies are not as applicable to lifestyle businesses because they require a lot of discipline and attention. I don't know. I'm putting words into your mouth here, but what? Okay. But what? What's the d- division in your mind? The distinction that makes this something that really isn't applicable in your mind to lifestyle businesses. Sure. For someone harder to work with, perhaps that's what was in your mind. Yeah, sure. Look, for, first of all, like from my perspective, a business owner is entitled to do whatever they want with their business. It's absolutely their business and it's their call. And many people are incredibly happy to take a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year out of the business and you know enjoy their weekends with their family and a couple of overseas trips. And they don't really want any more than that. So that's not a great fit for us in terms of what we do, because we would want to drive that business harder than the owner would. Yeah. And um, we would demand things off the owner that they probably don't want to do. So <laughs> so what like? Give me an example. Well, for example, if one of those, in fact, it's a recent example, we're working with an organisation in um, Melbourne where there was an opportunity um, to sell the business and um, the offer that was on the table was eye-wateringly good, um, where we were of the view that they should take the offer and our modelling on that business over the next three to five years is that some new complexity would come into that business that would make it less attractive to own it. So selling it's a good idea. Mm. And um, after some uh, discussion with the business owner, they kind of said, I'm happy just doing what I'm doing. Mm. I don't really want to stop doing this. So I don't Mm. want to. Mm. Um, So we couldn't really do any more for them because they actually kind of built a lifestyle into their business and they're entitled to that. That's completely fine. Um, The other one would be around, um, you know, um, pet projects and these sorts of things. You know, um, it might be a product. It might be sunk cost in some um, uh, geographic expansion that they've done that the analysis might say that's never going to work. So you just need to pull out of that and those people, you know, you need to close that office, for example. Mm. I don't really want to do that. Mm. Those, those sorts of things mm. where it's personal, they, 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 yep. those, they don't really work in the sort of work that we do. Mm. Um, so, and look, the reason that I ask, uh, the reason that I ask is because for many people who've chosen a lifestyle business, whether whether they recognise that that's what they've chosen or not, um, often won't necessarily understand the consequences to sale value at the end of the day. And this ties back to, I think, uh, this discussion that we had right in the beginning of the, the ep- this episode where we were talking about uh, the difference between growing a business um, and growing a business, understanding the concept of enterprise value and sale value at the end of the day. So is there always, I, I just want to be clear for business owners who are listening to this podcast what what the consequences are of a lifestyle business, where that comes in, and is it possible to have your cake and eat it too? <laughs> is there a way <laughs> without sacrificing, you know, because a lifestyle business, I guess, in and of itself is referring to uh, to a business that's, that um, is run within the confines of uh, the owner doing what they want when they want, uh, perhaps with a little bit less focus on the discipline that might be required to uh, to build 
really strong value would exit? Look, great question. Um, the the compelling reasons I think are there's a couple, and one of them is that the number of private businesses, privately owned businesses, that are going to change hand in change hands in the next you know, ten to fifteen years is a staggeringly high number in Australia. 80% of those businesses do not have an exit plan. They have yeah. got no formal plan whatsoever on how to exit that business and how to extract the value. This is the most compelling one in my mind, um, and I will need to clarify the numbers, but just in broad terms, something like 60% of business owners over the age of 55 will, will, will be required in the, in the next five years to either stop working in their business or substantially step back from managing their business because of a health issue of either their own or of their a, a, a loved one. Wow. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary number. So we've worked with many businesses where the choice of when to exit was not of the owner's making. And wow. there are some really sort of um, confronting examples. You know, we had a, a, a terrific client in Melbourne who built a business up over you know twenty plus years, um, and had never really put the right amount of effort into the um, exit planning, and had a massive heart attack. Survived the heart attack, and was told by their doctor that if they stepped foot back into their business, that they would be dead within six months. Wow. That, didn't have there would so the, the 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 medical recommendation was you cannot go back and run your business so from a very frail state this person then had to think about how do i employ management in the business how do i maintain the standards how do i unlock the ip that sits inside my head and how do i sort of operationalize that into the business so that deadline or that um, that decision was taken out of the hands of the owner and we don't we don't say that to be scaremongers we're in no way trying to be you know, fearmongers around this it's just that that's just the reality the numbers are that you know um, that something can interfere with your plans and your timing and it may not be your own so our view is that if you build to that today and you can own the business right up until the end we don't mind we actually don't care so much whether or not you choose to exit or not you can have a lifestyle business but it would be our view that you run it as if you intend to sell it yeah. for two reasons one is you'll be running a materially better business it'll be more profitable it'll be more enjoyable it'll have a better brand it'll you'll have a good employee value proposition people want to come and work for you there's a whole bunch of really good reasons why you should run it um, that efficiently. But importantly, um, if um, you make a decision to sell, you'll maximise your enterprise value. And if that decision is unfortunately made for you because of health or other circumstances, you are still making sure that you are maximising the value of that asset, which you've probably spent decades building. And, and you know, you and I have spoken about this before, that it's our very clear view that every owner deserves their payday. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, look, fabulous, Michael. I just want to say a massive thank you for coming on to the Deal Room podcast today. I'd actually like to have you back again and to really dig into the mistakes that business owners make when they're selling their business and also the, I guess, the steps to maximizing enterprise value because I think that will be a really useful discussion for us to step through. But um, until then, I guess we've finished off for today, but maybe before we leave, can you just give us a bit of a background about um, Evett Field? So where you are right now, what you're doing and, and who you're working with at the moment? Sure. We typically, as you know, work with mid-sized B2B organisations and that can be across a range of categories. You know, we have clients in agriculture, mining, defence, construction. Uh, very often the businesses that we work with are businesses that you might not think about. So they might be, you know, doing security bollards for shopping centres or something and you think, oh, well, of course somebody runs that business so typically <laughs> you know typically they're industrial they're manufacturing they're kind of out of mind out of sight uh and you know they the criteria that we talked about earlier you know committed leadership team aggressive growth target and a deadline that's an ideal client for us yeah absolutely wonderful and and how do you work with, with clients i th i think in the past we've discussed about brand and market positioning uh in order to drive top line revenue but what does that mean functionally practically 
Sure. The first part really is getting a genuine handle on what the current market position is, and that needs to be triangulated against what is their true organisational capability, not what they think it is or not what they say it is, but genuinely what is their organisational superpower. Secondly, understanding markets, customers and segments, so really defining what customers are looking for and where those um, hot spots are in the market where greater revenue is available. And then the third piece around that is it would be great if we could just get take our superpower and deliver it to customers who wanted it, but we need to do that in that competitive cauldron of you know competitive tension there's Mm. so the third part is really understanding well who are the competitors and to what extent can they um um damage you in your attempts to service those customers and achieve your revenue objectives. Brilliant. Okay, wonderful. Well, look, uh, Michael, I'm really excited to um, have you back on the show again so that we can drill into some of these mistakes and then some of these really concrete steps to maximising enterprise value. But until then, if our listeners are looking to uh, connect with you, how did they do that? They can find me on LinkedIn. Um, Just search Michael Field on LinkedIn or go to our website www.evettfield that's e-v-e-t-t-f-i-e-l-d.com and all of our contact details are on there brilliant okay wonderful and of course as always if you are running along the beach as you are listening to us today or um, on your commute into work then uh, have no fear don't uh, cause a traffic accident by trying to write that down it's in the show notes and we'll also link to it from our website well Michael just wanted to say a massive thank you and I'm looking forward to having you back thanks so much really appreciate the opportunity Well, that's it for this episode of the Deal Room Podcast with Michael Field from the consulting practice Everett Field Partners, where we really honed in on that topic of driving enterprise value and looked at competitive strategies, the key to unlocking revenue, profit and market share growth, and thereby increasing enterprise value at the end of the day. Well, look, I hope you found this episode interesting. And of course, if you'd like more information uh, about the topic or to find out how to make contact with Michael or Everett Field Partners, then just head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com. There you'll be able to find details of how to contact Michael um, and you'll also be able to find details of how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal if you or your clients would like to discuss any legal aspects or of sales or acquisitions. We have a range of services to help guide businesses through the sales and acquisitions process and work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. So don't hesitate to book an appointment if you want to find out how we might be able to assist. And finally, if you enjoyed what you heard today, then please pop over to iTunes and leave us a review. Well, that's it. Thanks again for listening in. You've been listening to Joanna Oki and the Deal Room Podcast, proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. 